Alrighty, welcome back to another episode of Wine for the People. This is a deep dive into one of Italy's famed grape varieties, one of the most globally recognized examples of wine from that country, and that would be Sangiovese. Sangiovese is the iconic grape of Italy. And at least if you think of Italian wine, it is the first grape that you think of. While some would argue that for the majority of plantings, Sangiovese makes okay wine, and there are varieties that showcase the country's finest qualities better, but it is very and quite comfortably Italy's most planted variety. It ranges from decent quality table wine served in very unique bottles to some otherworldly examples from Chianti and Brunello di Montalcino. It's got a deep, long and detailed history with links to Roman gods, monks, it's got interesting parentage. It's a variety that really has at all and in the last 50 years has had some of a makeover and consistently is becoming a stronger and stronger commercial success particularly in the United States which may have something to do with a very notable pop culture link but let's dive deep into Sangiovese. Now, Sangiovese is thought to have been a natural cross of a pair of very obscure varieties, which is pretty standard for Italy, especially since it's known for having thousands of particularly niche and obscure grape varieties all across the country. They mostly fill up this book. Those two varieties are Seligio, a very old variety from Tuscany that was used as a blending component in Sangiovese, and then Calabrese di Monte Nuovo, a very rare Calabrian variety. It seems Italian grapes are much like an actual Italian family. Very big, very close, as Sangiovese has some strong links to other varieties like Norello Mascalese and Frappato that are grown over in Sicily, and also a key grape in Calabria, Gagliopo. Now Sangiovese has a long history. Its first actual written documentation is in 1590, but legend has it that it's got its name from Sangius Jovis, which translates to Jupiter's blood, which is fucking metal. This was a term coined by a bunch of monks in Emilia Romagna, but the locals literally used to call it Vino. It actually took quite a while for the grape to be regarded as anything of particular noted quality. There was a lot of trepidation to the variety. In its first notation, Giovanni Vittorio Soderni stated that it can make great wine, but it can also turn to vinegar. Even a few hundred years later, writers like Cosimo Trissini and Giovanni Virafranchi thought that it was too acidic, too tannic, and could only make quality wines if there were other varieties blended into it. This is likely what has led for the long maturation and time required for the top end examples like Chianti. Anticlassico Reservas and Brunello di Montalcino and Vino Noble di Montepulciano. It is decreed by law that the wine spends several years in aging in oak, some degree of chestnut or large format Slovenian oak alongside mandatory bottle aging before release. But there is something to be said for the lovely, lighter, juicier, less structured wines that have adorned lunch tables globally for centuries, which is likely why they have created the more entry level styles like Chianti and Russell di Montalcino, which only requires a few months of bottle age. It's at this point I think we should talk about a quirk with Chianti, the bottles. For the most part, they're shipped in your standard Bordeaux-shaped wine bottle, but traditionally, Chianti was bottled in a teardrop-shaped glass with a wicker basket around it called a fiasco. A fiascos weren't exclusive to Chianti, and in fact, they were used for most wine, but they were made popular in the 14th century throughout the region. Were then used to hold olive oil and other local liquids, which has led to its immortalization in many works of period art from Italy. They even used them to cook beans over coals, and there is a very niche regional dish called fagoli al fiasco, beans al fiasco, basically. As Chianti grew into the most popular Italian wine style, blended with Trebbiano and other allowed grapes, this diluted the brand of Chianti, and along with it, the wicker baskets that it became associated with. Then, post-World War II, Bordeaux bottles became all the rage. And fiascos have largely been used as a bit of a gimmick since then. And you can still buy them, but they're a bit more of a decorative, touristy callback to the good old days. Chianti and Sangiovese have been become the most recognized styles of wine from Italy, and there is a crucial reason for this. The United States of America. With migration from Italy in the early 20th century, which has become such a rich and important part of the culture of America today, Chianti came along with it. And good, people-pleasing, affordable Chiantis became the staple of these migrant families as they started to open up restaurants to add to the tapestries of their local community. This led to Chianti and Sangiovese along with it, becoming known as inexpensive table wine built for comforting red sauce pastas. And to a certain extent, that is true. But this can brush over the aforementioned Chianti Classico Reservas, Brunello di Montalcino's and Vino Noble di Montepulciano's of the world, as some of these wines are truly world-class. And then there is, of course, Super Tuscans. Super Tuscans are blends of non-indigenous varieties that are more globally popular, namely Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, and Merlot. 
The first and most iconic example of this is a wine called Sasakaya, produced by Tenuta de San Guido, which is a Cab Sav blend with a little bit of Cab Franc. This led to a stack of imitators, but one stood out from the pack the eponymous Antonori family's Tignanello, a 70% Sangiovese blended with the pair of Cabernets. This is now generally viewed as the Super Tuscan style, blends of Sangiovese with international varieties in differing amounts. But the success of Sasakaya and Tignanello has led to the allowing of these international varieties in certain DOCs like Bulgaria, the home of Sasakaya. It's arguable that the country that really got behind Sangiovese outside of the States and Italy is Australia, as it's been here since the 70s, with early plantings from people like Montrose and um, Penfolds. Yep, Penfolds had a crack at it, but they weren't really stoked of it and found it difficult to sell in Australia, mainly due to the lack of interaction with Italian grapes that we had in Australia at the time. That drastically changed, particularly since a man named Mark Lloyd took charge with the variety and planted it in the McLaren Vale. With a wide variety of styles and countries, it may be hard to pick up Sangiovese in a blind tasting, but that is of course wine for the people specialty. But now the primary fruit flavors can be really easy to mix up with many other Italian varieties, red cherries, cranberry, raspberries, but the best thing to focus on is tannin. It's got a similar amount of tannin to something like Nebbiolo, but it feels entirely different. Nebbiolo gets in your gums, in between your teeth, but Sangiovese really sits on your tongue and on the roof of your mouth. It is a little bit less tar and iodine, it is a bit more espresso, dark chocolate. It's certainly one of the wine world's greater challenges in a blind tasting, so definitely one to revisit and revisit and taste and taste. Now there's many a Sangiovese worth a look in for taste's sake, so here's a good trifecta. As far as a local Australian number, maybe a Unico Zello past the firing. We've just made this 100% Sangiovese and we're absolutely wrapped on it. 100% Clare Valley fruit, amazing place for the varieties, 35 bucks, no worries. Ask for it at your local. In the United States, the legends at Brock Cellars have always made some of our favorite wines stateside, and their Sangiovese is no exception. Uh, for Chianti, or more specifically, Brunello di Montalcino, how about some Gyoto? Pretty good and premium gear, but it'll set you back a few hundred bucks, but it is one of the very few 100 point Brunello di Montalcino. Uh, and that's us today. Uh, I hope you guys like it. What do you guys think of Sangiovese? Have you had mostly table drinking, you know, easy two buck chuck little Sangiovese? Or do you love the more premium, amazing Brunellos of Vino Noble di Mont Montepulciano's of the world? Or even some local Aussie stuff. What do you guys think? That's all from us today. Let us know what you're thinking of these deep dives. Please let us know in the comments below. Uh, and we'll see you next time.